Welcome back to Giant Monster Games. I'm Adrian and today we are doing Black Red Vampires. This has been in the voting for a very long time and you guys keep voting for it, but it always kind of gets second best. I figured we would actually do this vampire deck finally for you guys. And it is a pretty cool deck. But before we actually get into it, if you are interested in picking this deck up or any other decks that are on the channel, go over to Flipside Gaming and use promo code Giant Monster Games for 10% off your online purchase. Yes, that is right. I want to save you money. Anyhow, let's get into it. Starting out with creatures, the first vampire we have is four copies of Gruuldraz Vampire. Now, this lady vampire starts out as a 1-1 one, one for 1, but if her opponent has 10 or less life, she gets a plus 2, plus 1, and intimidate, making her a 3-2 hard-to-block creature, which is fantastic for when we're trying to close out the game. Next, we have three copies of Stormkirk Noble. Now, he is a 1-1 one, one for 1 also, but his ability is whenever he deals combat damage to a player, we get to put a 1-1 one, one counter on him, which means he's going to slowly get bigger and bigger and bigger. The thing is, we have a lot of double black creatures in this deck, so we don't want to be playing a full four set of them because we don't really want to get red mana on first turn because we kind of want to have double black mana on second turn and double black mana on third turn. So it's a little bit of a wash because we'd really like to be playing four copies of this guy because he is awesome, especially if he gets in a little bit of damage. He starts becoming like a 2-2, two, 3-3 two, three, three, and becomes really difficult for your opponent to deal with if he doesn't deal with it right away. So a pretty awesome card. Again, one of our one drops. Moving into the two drop slot, we have four copies of Gatekeeper of Malakar. Now, he is a vampire. He is a 2-2 two, two for two, double black, or in this case, a lot of times triple black because his kicker cost is if we pay the kicker cost, our opponent, target player I should say, sacrifices a creature. So this is actually a control creature for us because we're going to be playing him usually for three mana and forcing our opponent to sacrifice something, which is usually really awesome for us because it allows us to control our opponent, which is always fun. Now we have two creatures which are almost the same, but not quite. We have Gifted Aetherborn and Vampire Nighthawk. We are running four copies of both these guys because they are both super awesome. As you can see, they both have double black their mana cost, which is what I was talking about with Sturmkirk Noble, because he is a one drop with red, and we want black on turn two, black, black on turn two. We have ways of fixing our mana base, which I'll talk about later. Let's focus on these guys right now. So they are both death touch lifelink creatures. Vampire Nighthawk has the added benefit of also having flying. So these creatures are super awesome because they are basically death touch creatures that have lifelink, so we can usually drag the game out. Our deck tends to be a little bit more of a mid-range deck, so going a little bit long is really good for us, and, and having some life gain just helps us get there. Now, a tribal deck would not be complete without some form of lord, so we have four copies of Stormkirk Captain and two copies of Paragon of Open Graves. Now, I know Paragon of the Open Graves is not a vampire, but it does have a really good ability, and as I'll talk about in the upgrade section, there is some awesome vampire lords that are just not very budget that you can easily replace in this guy with. Stormkirk Captain, on the other hand, is absolutely fantastic. So, he is a 2-2 for 3, which is whatever. He has First Strike, which is fantastic, but he gives all other vampires, plus one, plus one, and first strike. So, remember those two vampires we have that have death touch? Yeah! They do their damage and kill whatever they block first. It doesn't matter if it's bigger than them. That is absolutely fantastic. If we get to the late game, it doesn't matter if we're going up against Tron, it doesn't matter if we're going up against, like, a giant Eldrazi, because we block and kill them, we don't really care, which is fantastic. And we get to keep our creatures around, which is even better. Speaking of Death Touch, Paragon of Open Graves can give black creatures Death Touch as well, so that is also a neat ability if we do need it down the road. Again, we're running two copies of it because there are better Vampire Lords we could be running, which I'll talk about later. And the last Vampire we have is Olivia Voldaren. We're running two copies of her because she is a pretty good finisher card. She has some cool abilities as well. So, for starters, she is a 3-3, 4-4, which is okay. Has flying, which is fantastic. Her abilities, though, are what make her really special. So one, we can pay two mana, deal one damage to target creature, and she gets a plus one counter on it. That creature also becomes a vampire, which becomes relevant because her second ability, though, is we get to gain control of target vampire for as long as we control Olivia Volterran. So, it becomes pretty darn funny when we gain control of the creature and then our opponent has to deal with, like, what, what, do we, what do I do now? But unfortunately though, because she is a little bit more of the budget option vampire finisher, she can tend to die and then we lose that creature, where there's a couple vampire lords where that isn't the case, where we just permanently gain control of creatures. Again, talking about this in the upgrade section, which I seem to bring up a lot of this episode, because there is some fantastic upgrades that are just not very budget, but I'm sure they're going to come down in price now that the Commander Vampire set has recently come out. Moving over to our enchantment package, which is actually just two enchantments. We have two copies of Stentima Mass 
Masquerade. Now, this is giving all of our attacking creatures first strike, which is super relevant. Pretty awesome, if you ask me, because we do have a bunch of stuff with Death Touch, and we can give stuff Death Touch, so makes their stuff really hard to deal with. And it also has the added benefit of whenever a vampire we control deals combat damage to a player, we put a plus one counter on that creature. So our vampires, which tend to be a little bit smaller, are just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and making it super hard for our opponent to deal with, especially once we get to the mid to late game, because this is totally a mid-range deck, which means getting to mid to late game makes our opponent have a really hard time dealing with us. And lastly, before we get into lands, let's talk about our removal pack. Package. We are running four copies of Lightning Bolt because we're running red, so why not run Lightning Bolt? It is a fantastic card. Three to your opponent's face, three to a creature, whatever you want. It slices, it dices, cut chops. I've made this joke before, I think, actually. I'm just gonna hurry on. And four copies of Victim of Night, largely because it is the most budget removal spell that doesn't have a really hard condition. And again, we produce black matter pretty darn quickly because most of our stuff is already black black, so it's not a super big problem for us. And lastly, let's talk about our lands. We have four copies of Dragon Skull Summit and four copies of Smoldering Marsh. These guys allow us to get black and red mana. Obviously, Dragon Skull Summit is the better of the two because as long as we get a mountain or a swamp into play, which is super easy for us, it comes into play untapped. Smoldering Marsh, on the other hand, is a little bit harder for us to have come into play untapped because we need to have two or more basic lands. So this tends to be like a turn three, turn four play, not necessarily a turn one play unless we want it to come in tapped, which I find is super duper frustrating because there are way better lands we can be playing in modern. I'll actually go over a few of them once we get to the upgrade section. And then basic lands, we have five mountains and ten swamps, which should be pretty good for all of our mana needs. Okay, carrying over to the sideboard, we have two copies of Doomblade. If we need more creature removal, Doomblade is the second best one and is still very budget. Three copies of Duress, if we're running up against combo or control, it is a lot easier for us to try and just remove stuff from their hand rather than trying to remove stuff off the table, largely because we have no way of actually dealing with enchantments in this deck other than Duress. Four copies of Evil Presence. Now, this card is amazing. I just recently learned this card. It basically turns any land into a swamp. So goodbye Tron, goodbye three color decks, goodbye a lot of decks because it costs one. On turn one we get to like turn their stuff into a swamp, which is extremely fantastic and like super budget. This card is like 14 cents right now, which is insane. Blows my mind seeing how Reign of Tears is more expensive and costs three. One copy of Harsh Mentor, this is helping us with a lot of combo decks, also dealing some extra damage if we're running up against a deck that's doing a bunch of fetching, so if we're playing against Grixis or Abzan or Jund, we can throw this guy in and he can usually get an extra 2 or 4 damage in just from our opponent fetching lands because it deals damage what our opponent fetches, which is fantastic. Two copies of Pyroclasm, this is helping us deal with go-wide strategies or something I've actually learned is it helps us deal with burn really well because it allows us to wipe the board of their stuff and usually we can maintain our stuff because it's not very hard for our creatures to get to 3 toughness, so we can usually use this to wipe their board and then keep going through burn, which is usually what we need to use it for. And lastly, the card that does it all, Rakdos Charm. This card can wipe graveyard, so getting rid of Dredge, getting rid of stuff that's using Snapcaster Mage. It can destroy artifacts, so the artifact destruction, which is always good. And lastly, if we are going up against a go-wide strategy, even one that allows us not to target our opponent, we can use this and then each creature deals one damage to its controller. We don't need to target our opponent because it is passive damage, really. So this can be really, really good against prison decks, token decks, dredge decks. I mean, it's good against everything. This card literally is good against every deck. I almost put it in every single time I play. And that is the entire Red Black Vampires deck. Now, before we end the video, let's talk about some upgrades. There are three really good lords I would like to point out that can easily replace Paragon of Open Graves. First one being Bloodline Keeper, second one being Captivating Vampire, and third one being Vampire Nocturnus. Vampire Nocturnus, I think, is the most playable of the three, but if you are playing a little more casual, any of these lords are vampires and are actually really good. So, I'll run down why they're pretty good. Bloodline Keeper is good because he's a 3-3 flying that creates vampires. When you transform him, he makes all vampires have plus two, plus two, and still creates more vampires, which is fantastic. Captivating Vampire also gives all of our vampires plus one, plus one, plus we can tap five untapped vampires we control and gain control of target creature. That creature also becomes a vampire. The thing is, unlike a Olivia Volterran, if this guy dies, we still keep that creature, where Olivia makes us give that creature back to its owner. And then Vampire Recturnus, which is the best of these three, as long as there is a black card on top of our library, our creatures get plus two, plus one, and flying. So the evasion can let us close up the game extremely quickly. So this guy is fantastic. There are some other good win conditions you can be adding to this deck. There is Drana Liberator of Malakar and Kalidus Traitor of Get. Both of these cards are absolutely fantastic win conditions and obviously can be replacing cards with the same mana cost. Drana allows our creatures to get 
absolutely huge because as she deals damage, we put all our counters and everything, and then all of our creatures actually deal damage, which is awesome. Kalidus, on the other hand, is just, just straight up awesome. He has lifelink, he creates zombies, he can sacrifice zombies or vampires to make himself bigger. He is an absolute beater card and actually sees a lot of play in modern already, so playing him in this deck just makes this deck a little bit more viable. If you want to put this deck a little bit more on theme of the vampires, we also have Bloodgast and Blade of the Blood Chief. I don't know how much synergy they really have in the deck because Bloodgast can't block, but he does have insane recursion, so really good, especially if you upgrade the mana base and put in some fetch lands. Bloodgast becomes a Amazing. And then Blade of the Blood Sheaf is just a really good way of making our creatures bigger for really cheap. Whenever a creature dies, we get to put a 1-1 counter on a equipped creature. Two of those counters if this was a vampire, which everything in our deck would be a vampire. So whenever a creature period dies, it doesn't have to be our creature. It can definitely be our opponent's creatures. So it is, it's a neat thing. It's definitely something if you want to make this deck a more vampire themed, this can be a good way of doing it. Then lastly, I told you we would talk about some lands for a little bit. First thing is Cavern of Souls naming vampires would be absolutely Absolutely fantastic in this deck because it would create red or black or whatever color mana we need as long as we're playing creatures of that type. Also the named creature type can't be countered which makes our deck extremely hard to deal with if we're going against any kind of blue deck. We can also be running Blood Crypt and Bloodstained Mire in this deck. I would obviously like to be running four of each because they are really good and also probably four of the Dragon Skull Summits because they are actually a really good card as well. You can totally remove the Smoldering Marsh. It is not that good in this deck when you are running these cards instead. The rest can be basic lands of your choice. And that's it, and that's the entire deck deck. I hope you guys enjoyed this Black Red Vampires deck. My name's Adrian, this has been Giant Monster Games, and until next time, don't forget to game like a giant monster.